The Great Liberal Death Wish by Malcolm Muggeridge Searching in my mind for an appropriate name for the 70s, I settle for the decade of the Great Liberal Death Wish. It seems to me that this process of death wishing, in the guise of liberalism, has been eroding the civilization of the West for a century and more, and is now about to reach its apogee. The liberal mind, effective everywhere, whether in power or in opposition, particularly so during the present period of American world domination, has provided the perfect instrument. Systematically, stage by stage, dismantling our Western way of life, depreciating and deprecating all its values, so the whole social structure is now tumbling down, dethroning its god, undermining all its certainties, and finally mobilizing a praetorian guard of ribald students maintained at the public expense and ready at the drop of a hat to go into action, not only against their own weak-kneed, bemused academic authorities, but also against any institution or organ for the maintenance of law and order still capable of functioning, especially the police. And all this, wonderfully enough, in the name of the health, wealth, and happiness of mankind. Previous civilizations have been overthrown from without by the incursion of barbarian hordes. Ours has dreamed up its own dissolution in the minds of its own intellectual elite. It has carefully nurtured its own barbarians, all reared on the best Dr. Spock lines, sent to progressive schools and colleges, fitted with contraceptives or fed birth pills at puberty, mixing D.H. Lawrence with their Coca-Cola, and imbibing the headier stuff, Marcuse, Chairman Mao, Malcolm X, in evening libations of hot chocolate. Not Bolshevism, which Stalin liquidated along with all the old Bolsheviks, not Nazism, which perished with Hitler in his Berlin bunker, not Fascism, which was left hanging upside down along with Mussolini and his mistress from a lamp post. None of these, history will record, was responsible for bringing down the darkness on our civilization, but liberalism, a solvent rather than a precipitate, a sedative rather than a stimulant, a slough rather than a precipice, blurring the edges of truth, the definition of virtue, the shape of beauty, a cracked bell, a mist, a death wish. I was fortunate enough myself, while still in my late twenties, to be presented with a demonstration of the great liberal death wish at work, so manifest, so incontestable in its implications, and at the same time so hilariously funny, that I have never subsequently felt the smallest doubt that here lay the key to the tragic comedy of our time. It happened in Moscow in the autumn of 1932 and spring of 1933, when I was working there as correspondent for the then Manchester Guardian. In those days, Moscow was the mecca for every liberal mind, whatever its particular complexion. They flocked there in an unending procession, from the great ones like Shaw and Gita and Barbus and Julian Huxley and Harold Lasky and the Webbs, down to poor little teachers, crazed clergymen and millionaires, and driveling dons, all utterly convinced that, under the aegis of the great Stalin, a new dawn was breaking in which the human race would at last be united in liberty, equality, and fraternity forevermore. Stalin himself, to do him justice, never troubled to hide his contempt for them in everything they stood for, and mercilessly suppressed any like tendencies among his own people. This, however, in no way deterred them. They were prepared to believe anything, however preposterous, to overlook anything, however villainous, to approve anything, however obscurantist and brutally authoritarian, in order to be able to preserve intact the confident expectation that one of the most thoroughgoing, ruthless, and bloody tyrannies ever to exist on earth could be relied on to champion human freedom, the brotherhood of man, and all the other good liberal causes to which they had dedicated their lives. It is true that many of them subsequently retracted, that incidents like the Stalinist purges, the Nazi-Soviet pact, 
the debunking of Stalin at the 20th Party Congress, the Hungarian and Czech risings, each caused a certain leakage among liberal well-wishers. Yet when the dust settles, the same old bias is clearly discernible. It is an addiction, like alcoholism, to which the liberal mind is intrinsically susceptible, to grovel before any Beelzebub who claims, however implausibly, to be the prince of liberals. Why? After all, the individuals concerned are ostensibly the shining lights of the Western world. Scholars, philosophers, artists, scientists, and the like, the favored children of a troubled time, held in respect as being sages who know all the answers, sought after by governments and international agencies, holding forth in the press and on the air the glory of faculties and campuses, beating a path between Harvard and Princeton and Washington, D.C., swarming like migrant birds from the London School of Economics, Oxford and Cambridge, into Whitehall. Yet I have seen their prototypes, and I can never forget it, in the role of credulous buffoons capable of being taken in by grotesquely obvious deceptions, swallowing unquestioningly statistics and other purported data whose falsity was immediately evident to the meanest intelligence, full of idiot delight when Stalin or one of his henchmen yet again denounced the corrupt, cowardly intelligentsia of the capitalist West, vis-a-vis -vis themselves. I detect in their like today the same impulse. They pass on from one to another like a torch held upside down, the same death wish. Editors come and go, newspapers decline and fold, labor governments form and unform, after Roosevelt, Truman, and then Eisenhower, after Kennedy, Johnson, and then Nixon. But the great liberal death wish goes marching on. In those far-off days in Moscow, it was possible to discuss matters like distinguished visiting intellectuals with officials of the press department of the Soviet Foreign Office, with whom, of course, we foreign journalists were in constant contact. Most of them were Russian Jews who had lived abroad before the revolution. Unlike the usual sort of wooden face Soviet functionary, they had a sense of humor and a taste for irony. One and all, as it happened, were fated to be shot when, later on, Stalin swung the regime back to traditional Russian anti-Semitism. Yes, of course, they said, people like Shaw and the Webbs were natural stool pigeons, historically destined to play a Judas part and betray. Admittedly, rather out of vanity than cupidity, their own phony liberal principles to a triumphant Marxist revolutionary movement in whose eyes they were, and must always be, anathema. Meanwhile, they had their usefulness, if only in reassuring the Soviet authorities that whatever they might feel bound to do in the way of terrorism and dictatorial practices, they never need worry their heads about hostile reactions in enlightened circles and newspapers in the West. The foreign office men told me that they even on occasion amused themselves by seeing how far they could go in gulling distinguished visitors, fabricating production statistics and Stachovanite feats at the factory bench, which could not possibly be true. However tall their stories, they were invariably believed and often quoted in learned publications abroad. The credulity of their visitors was, it seemed, fathomless. To the fevered mind of a Senator Joseph McCarthy, or the more sedate but still irascible one of a Vice President Spiro Agnew, even to so erudite and responsible a citizen as Enoch Powell, it all smells unmistakably of conspiracy. How otherwise to account for the fact that the liberal mind, like Death Watch Beetles, seems to be active in all the rafters and foundations of the state? So they imagine suborned men and hurl wild accusations and denunciations. Ah, if only it were a conspiracy! How easy, then, to apprehend the principles and subdue their dupes! 
but a death wish subconsciously entertained in newspaper offices and college faculties, in television and radio studios, in churches of all denominations, wherever two or more Illuminati are gathered together, that is something else. To suppress a death wish, it is necessary to proclaim a corresponding life wish, which is just what a Senator McCarthy, a Vice President Agnew, an Enoch Powell cannot do, with the result that their wild accusations only serve to advance the very thing they believe they are attacking. They remind me of an old evangelical missionary I came across years ago in South India when I was living there. This good man had got in the way of appearing each year at a local Hindu festival and denouncing the god Shiva, before whom devotees were prostrating themselves. At first he was stoned, then just cursed and insulted, and finally taken for granted. When the time came for him to retire, the organizers of the festival petitioned his missionary society to send a replacement. He had become part of the show. Recalling, in the light of these experiences, my time as an editorial writer on The Guardian before going to Moscow, I realized that there, in that citadel of liberalism, we were engaged in spelling out the essential terms of the great liberal death wish. All our protestations and prognostications were governed by its exigencies. Thus, in our editorials, it was a basic principle that our enemies were always in the right and our friends in the wrong. If, for instance, a British soldier was killed anywhere, it was an unfortunate consequence of the brutal and crooked policies the poor fellow was required to implement. If, on the other hand, a British soldier killed someone, the victim was automatically a blessed martyr to be mourned and possibly made the subject of a demonstration by all decent liberal people. Likewise, any Indians who were misguided enough to be our friends became thereby worthless and despicable figures in our eyes. With the exception, curiously enough, of the Aga Khan, who really was worthless. The repute in which he was held, however, was not due to any appreciation of his political views, but rather to his eminence on the racetrack, something so esteemed by the English that it covers even being on our side. Other Indians, like Nehru, who specialized in holding us up to hatred and contempt, were treated with the utmost consideration. I note that a similar role has come to be adopted by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other high-toned American newspapers, as well as by the more eminent radio and television commentators, who pour out their wrath and derision on any poor sucker who is fool enough to support the American side anywhere but who are quick to offer sympathetic treatment to a Castro, a Ho Chi Minh, a Che Guevara, none of whom can be regarded as exactly Americanophile. As far as the death wish or Gadarene stakes are concerned, I calculate that America is running a shade behind us, but is going hard in the direction of the same cliff. In the view we propounded of Europe in the Guardian's columns, in those just pre-Hitler years, the villain was France, armed to the teeth, and, we insisted, ruthlessly pursuing selfish national ends. The hero, a much-wronged Germany, disarmed, bankrupted, victimized by greedy, revengeful victors in the 1914-18 war. No view could have better pleased the then-emerging Dr. Goebbels, or have been more conductive to the disaster of September 1939 more especially as it was combined with an unwavering, sanctimonious refusal to countenance anything in the nature of rearming, and a naive, obstinately held faith in the ramshackle League of Nations as a peacekeeping instrument. In this way, our national interests were damaged far more drastically than by anything a specifically conspiratorial body, like the common turn, could hope to achieve. We were led into a war we had little chance of winning, and whose outcome, whether we were on the winning or the losing side, was bound to be, as far as we were concerned, ruinous, a bull's eye for the great liberal death wish. 
In the same sort of way, today's version of the liberal mind makes America the universal villain. Sinister American pressures and stratagems are detected behind every financial and economic crisis everywhere in the world, as are the machinations of the CIA behind every reactionary regime or takeover. America is seen as the watchdog of the capitalist imperialist status quo, just as France was in the post-1914-18 war years. No doubt, in due course, there will be a similar awakening. Such an attitude, contradictorily enough, is combined with an eager acceptance of current American styles and practices. Veterans of American campus fighting are to the fore in student disorders in London, Paris, and Berlin. American pot, pornography, Andy Warhol films, and other intimations of decadence and decay find a ready market across the Atlantic. The demonstrators who advance on London policemen guarding the United States Embassy in Grosvenor Square are mostly jeans-clad, infantile, slogan-chanting, obscenities-mouthing, tousled, tangled, bearded baboons who yell pigs and fuzz in the true Berkeley manner. In other words, what is objected to is the now waning American endeavor to underpin crumbling West European economies and reinforce such defenses as can be mustered there against an attack from the East. The incursions of American decadence are as easily welcomed as these efforts are abhorred, a characteristic death-wishing stance. Again, when the final decomposition of the British Empire took place, the death wish, operating through the liberal mind, ensured that, having shed a real empire, we should have a phantom one on our hands in the shape of the so-called British Commonwealth, the most ephemeral setup of the kind since the Holy Roman Empire, involving us in the cares and expenses of an empire with none of the compensations. Thus, we have been forced to finance and sometimes defend demagogue dictators of the most unedifying kind, who have ridden to power on the one-man, one-vote principle so dear to liberal hearts. It is a case of responsibility without power, the opposite of the prerogative of the harlot. A similar process may be detected at work in America, whereby the liberal mind's proneness to excessive guilt feelings has induced so fawning and sycophantic an attitude towards Negro discontent and subversion that lifelong white agitators for civil rights, inveterate freedom marchers and admirers of Martin Luther King, integrationists who have squatted and howled and been carried screaming away by the police for years past, nowadays find themselves being kicked in the teeth by Black Panthers and other Negro militants with a ferocity that might seem excessive directed against the reddest of rednecks. I ask myself how this predilection for enemies and distaste for friends came to pass in what many of us have been brought up to regard as the most cultivated and enlightened minds of our time. Why it has seemed so obvious to them that whatever commends itself to our well-wishers must be despicable, and whatever serves the interests of our ill-wishes must be beneficial. Why, for instance, there should be so unanimous a feeling in such circles in the United States that the discrediting of American policies and the defeat of American arms in Vietnam represents a progressive aspiration, and the converse a reactionary one. Why? in a world full of oppressive regimes and terrorist practices, in England the venom and fury of the liberal mind should pick on the white South Africans with particular spleen when their oligarchic rule only differs from that of a dozen others, Titos, Francos, Ulbrichs, Castros, etc., etc., and that they happen to be anxious to be on good terms with the English. What but a death wish? could bring about so complete a reversal of all the normal worldly considerations of good sense, self-interest, and a desire to survive. I remember reading in Taine's Origins of Contemporary France of how, shortly before the Revolution, a party of affluent liberal intellectuals were discussing over their after-dinner cognac 
all the wonderful things that were going to happen when the Bourbon regime was abolished and freedom, a la Voltaire and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, reigned supreme. One of the guests, hitherto silent, suddenly spoke up. Yes, he said, the Bourbon regime would indeed be overthrown, and in the process, pointing round, you and you and you will be carried screaming to the guillotine. You and you and you go into penurious exile. And, now pointing in the direction of some of the elegant ladies present, you and you and you will hawk your bodies round from sans culotte to sans culotte. There was a moment of silence while this, as it turned out, all too exact prophecy sank in, and then the previous conversation was resumed. I know several fashionable and affluent households in London and Washington and Paris where similar conversations take place, and where similarly exact prophecies might be made, without, as on the occasion Taine so appositely described, having the slightest impact. It would seem to be clear, then, that the great liberal death wish arises out of a historical or maybe biological necessity, rather than out of any rational or even irrational considerations. Civilizations, like classes and families and regimes, degenerate, and so must be wound up. Just as the great-grandson of some famous ducal figure or billionaire may have thrust upon him the disagreeable fate of ending his line, and drooling and dissolute duly ends it. So the liberal mind, likewise drooling, has been entrusted with the historic task of bringing to an end what we are supposed to be defending with might and main. I mean what we still like to call our free way of life and the free institutions which have sustained it. On such a basis, all the views, attitudes, values, and recommendations of the liberal mind today make complete sense. Going back to my Moscow experience, those eminent intellectuals abasing themselves before Stalin and so fatuously accepting his bona fides as a lover of human freedom and enlightenment were simply fulfilling a manifest destiny to abolish themselves, their culture, and their world. Suppose that somehow or other a lot of contemporary pabulum videotape of television programs with accompanying advertisements, news footage, copies of newspapers and magazines, stereotapes of pop groups and other cacophonies, best-selling novels, films, and other such material, gets preserved, like the Dead Sea Scrolls in some remote salt cave. Then, some centuries, or maybe millennia later, when our civilization will have long since joined all the others that once were, and now can only be patiently reconstructed out of dusty ruins, incomprehensible hieroglyphics and other residuary relics, archaeologists discover the cave, and set about sorting out its contents and trying to deduce from them what we were like, and how we lived. This is assuming, of course, that we do not, in the process of working out the great liberal death wish, blow ourselves and all the earth to smithereens. A large assumption. What will they make of us? I wonder. Materially so rich and so powerful, spiritually so impoverished and fear-ridden, having made such a remarkable inroads into the secrets of nature, beginning to explore and perhaps to colonize the universe itself, developing the means to produce in more or less unlimited quantities everything we could possibly need or desire, and to transmit swifter than light every thought, smile, or word that could possibly delight, entertain, or instruct us. Disposing of treasure beyond calculation, opening up possibilities beyond conception, yet haunted and obsessed by the fear that we are too numerous, that soon, as our numbers go on increasing, there will be no room or food for us. On the one hand, a neurotic passion to increase consumption, sustained by every sort of imbecile persuasion. On the other, ever-increasing hunger and penury among the so-called backward and underdeveloped peoples. Never, our archaeologists will surely conclude, was any generation of men intent upon the pursuit of happiness 
more advantageously placed to attain it, who yet, with seeming deliberation, took the opposite course, towards chaos, not order, towards breakdown, not stability, towards death, destruction, and darkness, not life, creativity, and light, an ascent that ran downhill, plenty that turned into a wasteland, a cornucopia whose abundance made hungry, a death-wish inexorably unfolding. Searching about in their minds for some explanation of this pursuit of happiness that became a death-wish, the archaeologists, it seems to me, would be bound to hit upon the doctrine of progress, probably the most ludicrous, certainly the most deleterious, fancy, ever to take possession of the human heart, the liberal mind's basic dogma, the notion that human beings as individuals must necessarily get better and better is even now considered by most people to be untenable in the light of their indubitably outrageous behavior towards one another. But the equivalent collective concept that their social circumstances and conduct must necessarily improve has come to seem almost axiomatic. On this basis, all change represents progress and is therefore good. To change anything is, per se, to improve or reform it. For instance, to dilute the marriage tie to the point that it no longer impedes virtually unrestrained promiscuity, or provides the possibility of a stable home to bring up children in, is a reform. To oppose this, reactionary. Likewise, to abolish all restrictions on what may be published or publicly shown as entertainment is a reform, even though it opens up the way for an avalanche of pornography and gives full freedom to operate to the sinister individuals and interests engaging in this unsavory trade. Again, the legalization of abortion is a reform, as, we may be sure, will be claimed in due course for the legalization of euthanasia. In Germany, under the Nazi regime, a decidedly liberal one in this field, sterilization of the allegedly unfit was practiced with a zeal and expedition that must be the envy of our eugenists, forced as they are to adopt such paltry devices as offering transistor radio sets to putative Indian sterilese. The Nazis were able, too, to dispose painlessly and expeditiously of unproductive citizens. What the French, with their usual brutal realism, call useless mouths, without any questions being asked, and to conduct experiments in transplant surgery that would have uplifted Dr. Christian Bernard himself. All this Nazi-sponsored progress was summarily interrupted by Germany's military defeat in 1945, but after a decent interval has been resumed in the victor countries. It will surely lead to a decision which I have an uneasy feeling has already been taken, at any rate subconsciously, not to go on much longer bearing the burden of caring for the senile and incurable mentally sick. Hence, the starving of these services for funds and personnel, the noticeable reluctance to build new accommodation, when expenditure on public health generally has been soaring. I anticipate quite soon a campaign conducted at the most elevated moral level to dispose painlessly of incurables in gerontological and psychiatric wards, no doubt acquiring a useful reserve of transplantable organs in the process. It will represent an important advance for the liberal mind and for the great liberal death wish. It was, of course, Darwin's theory of natural selection which first popularized the notion that man and his environment are involved in an endless and automatic process of improvement. Who can measure the consequences of this naive assumption? What secret subversive organization, endowed with unlimited funds and resources, could hope to achieve a thousandth part of what it achieved in the way of discrediting the then prevailing moral values and assumptions? putting in their place nothing more than vague sentimental hopes of collective human betterment and the liberal mind to entertain them. It is interesting to reflect that now, in the light of all that has happened, the early obscurantist opponents of Darwinian evolution 
seem vastly more sagacious and far-seeing than its early excited champions. There must be quite a number today who, like myself, would rather go down in history, even as a puffing, portentous Bishop Wilberforce, than say, a Herbert Spencer, or a poor, squeaky H.G. Wells, ardent evolutionist and disciple of Huxley, with his vision of an earthly paradise achieved through science and technology, those twin monsters which have laid waste a whole world, polluting its seas and rivers and lakes with poisons, infecting its very earth and all its creatures, reaching into man's mind and inner consciousness to control and condition him, at the same time entrusting to irresponsible, irresolute human hands the instruments of universal destruction. It must be added that, confronted with this prospect, when, at the very end of his life, the first nuclear explosion was announced, Wells turned his face to the wall, letting off his mind at the end of its tether, one last despairing, whimpering cry, which unsaid everything he had ever thought or hoped. Belatedly, he understood that what he had followed as a life force was, in point of fact, a death wish, unto which he was glad to sink the little that remained of his own life in the confident expectation of total and final obliteration. The enthronement of the gospel of progress necessarily required the final discrediting of the gospel of Christ and the destruction of the whole edifice of ethics, law, culture, human relationships, and human behavior constructed upon it. Our civilization, after all, began with the Christian revelation, not the theory of evolution, and we may be sure will perish with it too, if it has not already. Jesus of Nazareth was its founding father not Charles Darwin. It was Paul of Tarsus who first carried its message to Europe, not Karl Marx or even Lenin. Jesus, by dying on the cross, abolished death-wishing. Dying became thenceforth life's glory and fulfillment. So when Jesus called on his followers to die in order to live, he created a tidal wave of joy and hope on which they have ridden for 2,000 years. The gospel of progress represents the exact antithesis. It plays the crucifixion backwards, as it were. In the beginning was the flesh, and the flesh became word. In the light of this logos in reverse, the quest for hope is the ultimate hopelessness, the pursuit of happiness, the certitude of despair, the lust for life, the embrace of death. The liberal assault on Christianity has been undertaken with a fury and fervor, which today, when the battle seems to have been conclusively won, is difficult to comprehend. I well remember my surprise in a television encounter with Bertrand Russell at discovering in him an almost demented hatred of Christ in Christianity, to which he attributed all the horrors and misfortunes mankind has had to endure since the fall of the Roman Empire. As I attempted to confute this view, I found myself watching with fascination a red flush which rose steadily up his thin, stringing neck and spread to his face. The receding chin, the pasty flesh, the simian features struck me then as suggestive of a physical degeneracy, doubtless to be expected in view of his family history, matching the moral degeneracy he had done so much to promote. It was a cruel and doubtless unfair light in which to see him, a product, I dare say, of the passionate and physically agonizing conflict in which I found myself involved. At the time, however, the impression was particularly vivid and convincing, and abides with me still. The script of this strange encounter is still extant, and reveals the philosopher in a most unphilosophic mood roaring and bellowing like any atheist orator at Hyde Park Corner. In the light of it, I derived a lot of quiet amusement from the tributes paid to Russell by eminent churchmen when he died. To the best of my knowledge, there was not one single ecclesiastical or clerical voice raised to point out that the great influence Russell undoubtedly exerted was inimical to the Christian faith and the moral standards derived therefrom. It is rather as though one 
were to find in the literature of the Royal Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals a panegyric of bullfighting or fox hunting, or to fall in with a party of total abstainers on their way to a wine festival in Provence. Yet even these comparisons pale into insignificance when we have clergymen who find an echo of the Gospels in the brutal materialism of Marx and Engels, who lay wreaths on shrines to Lady Chatterley, or even to Playboy magazine, or, what must surely be the final reductio ad absurdum, a sometime lecturer in biblical studies at Manchester University, who detects in the New Testament the encoded version of a phallic narcotic cult based on the consumption of particular mushrooms. It is indeed among Christians themselves that the final decisive assault on Christianity has been mounted, led by the Protestant churches, but with Roman Catholics eagerly, if belatedly, joining in the fray. All they had to show was that when Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this world, he meant that it was. Then, moving on from there, to stand the other basic Christian propositions similarly on their heads. As that to be carnally minded is life, that it is essential to lay up treasure on earth in the shape of a constantly expanding gross national product, that the flesh lusts with the spirit and the spirit with the flesh, so that we can do whatever we have a mind to, that he that loveth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal, and so on. One recalls a like adjustment of the rules in Orwell's Animal Farm, a whole series of new interpretive translations of the Bible have appeared to supporting the new view, and in case there should be any anxiety about the reception of those adjustments in heaven, God, we are told on the best theological authority, has died. To counteract any anxiety on earth, there is the concept of situational ethics, whereby our moral obligations are governed not by a moral law or moral order underlying all earthly ones, but by the circumstances in which we happen to find ourselves. Thus, the Ten Commandments have only a conditional validity. It may, in particular circumstances, be positively virtuous to covet a neighbor's goods or seduce his wife. Reacting accordingly, Roman Catholic priests and religious are walking out in shoals to resume the material and sensual preoccupations they once thought it proper to renounce, or from within demand the right to follow Demas and love this present world. As for the congregations, not surprisingly, they are dwindling fast. Situational ethics prepares the way for situational worship, a state of affairs not remedied by introducing pop groups, folk singers, and, I dare say, in time, LSD and the strip tees to enliven the divine service. The new enlightened clergy positively revel in the decline in church attendance, gleefully recommending selling off redundant churches and their contents, and looking forward to the time when institutional Christianity, like the state in Marxist mythology, will have withered away. In this aspiration, at any rate, they are unlikely to be disappointed. In the moral vacuum left by thus emptying Christianity of its spiritual or transcendental content, the great liberal death wish has been able to flourish and luxuriate, the more so because it can plausibly masquerade as aiming at its opposite, life enhancement. Thus our wars, each more ferocious and destructive than the last, are to establish once and for all the everlasting reign of peace. As the media spout bigger and better lies, their dedication to truth is the more insistently proclaimed. One thinks again of Orwell in the Ministries of Truth and Peace in 1984, the former, as he told me himself, being based on the BBC, where he worked for a while during the 1939-45 to war, again in a frenzied quest for the physical and mental well-being which should accompany the pursuit of happiness as naturally as a tan comes from lying in the Mediterranean sun, 
resort to drugs steadily increases, as does the variety available, while medicine men, doctors, psychiatrists, and the like, are in ever greater demand, assuming the role of priests, advising and molding their flock, uplifting and depressing them, keeping them alive and killing them off as they think fit. Just where happiness seems most accessible, in the happy lands, the Scandinavias and Californias, many jump after it from upstairs windows, or gulp it down in colored barbiturates, or try to tear it out of one another's bodies, or scatter it in blood and bone about the highways, along which, with six lanes aside, and Muzak endlessly playing, automobiles roll on from nowhere to nowhere. Pascal says that when man becomes separated from God, two courses present themselves. To imagine that they are gods themselves and try to behave as such, or alternatively, to seek for enduring satisfaction in the transitory pleasures of the senses. The one sends them, like Icarus, flying into the bright furnace of the sun, there to perish. The other reduces them to far below the level of the farmyard, where the cows with their soft eyes, and the hens with their shrill cries, and the strutting peacocks, and the grunting pigs, down to the tiny darting flies and wasps and insects, all live out whatever span of animal existence is vouchsafed them under God's kindly gaze. Men are denied this satisfaction. If they set up as a farmyard, it is a place of dark fantasies and weird imaginings. Prometheus, unbound, chaining himself to the rock, and there, day by day, gorging his own entrails. Both these recourses have played their part in the unfolding of the great liberal death wish. In their laboratories, men like gods are working on our genes to remake them after their own image, with computers for minds, and all our procreation done in test tubes, leaving us free to frolic with our sterilized bodies as we please in unconstrained and perfect bliss. Other men like gods build towers of Babel in glass and chromium, reaching higher and higher into the sky. Yet others prepare the broiler houses and factory farms for men, not fowls and beasts, even designing for us, as gods should, a kind of immortality, keeping us on the road indefinitely like vintage cars by replacing our organs as they wear out kidney, heart, lungs, genitals, brain even, with spare parts from newer models, young heads on old shoulders, new bullocks on old crotches. As for the farmyard, what a gilded sty has been devised, what ambrosial fodder, what perfumed rutting, melodious orgasmic grunts, downy straw and succulent swill. If the purpose of life is, indeed, to pursue happiness here and now on this earth, then clearly it can only be realized in terms of what this earth provides, that is, of goods and toys, of egotistic success or celebrity, of diversions like speed and travel and narcotic fantasies, above all, of sexual pleasure and excitement, which alone offers an additional illusory sense of transcendental satisfaction, notably lacking in another Cadillac, a trip to Tibet or to the moon, or a press of autograph hunters. Sex is the only mysticism materialism offers, and so does sex the pursuers of happiness address themselves with an avidity and dedication seldom if ever surpassed. Who among posterity will ever be able to reconstruct the resultant scene? Who, for that matter, can convey it today? The vast, obsessive outpouring of erotica in every shape and form, in book and film and play and entertainment, in body and word and deed, so that there is no escape for anyone. 
the lame and the halt, the doddering and the infirm, equally called upon somehow to squeeze out of their frail flesh the requisite response. It is the flesh that quickeneth, the spirit profiteth nothing. Copulo ergo sum, I screw, therefore I am, the new version of Descartes' famous axiom. All possible impediments swept away, no moral taboos, no legal ones either. An orgasm a day, however procured, keeps the doctor away. Pornography, like Guinness, is good for us, as numerous learned doctors and professors have been at great pains to establish. For instance, a Dr. O. Elthammer of the Stockholm Child Psychiatric Department, who, I read in a letter to the New Statesman, has proved conclusively that pornography does not have a corrupting effect by showing to some children between the ages of 11 and 18 a film of a woman being raped by a group of intoxicated louts and then forced to have intercourse with a dog. None of the children, the doctor triumphantly concluded, was frightened during or after the film, but a proportion of the older girls did admit to being shocked, while two adults also present needed psychological treatment for a month afterward. One idly wonders what, if anything, happened to the dog. Each seeming impediment provides an occasion for another spurt. If one Cadillac fails to produce the requisite yield of happiness, then two assuredly will. If not two, then three or four or five. If going to bed with one particular woman proves wearisome, then try another, or two at a time, or an orgy, or jumping from a candelabrum, or any other device or combination. For fuel to keep this fire going, the pornography of the ages is dredged and dredged again, as are the sick memories and imaginings of popular novelists. The fire's extinction would spell not just impotence, but exclusion from life itself, like those poor souls in Dante's Inferno, without a place in either heaven or hell. Whatever else may be the case, the magic formula itself cannot be wrong. It must, it must work, so try again. The psychiatric wards fill to overflowing with deluded pursuers of happiness whose quest has proved abortive. Guiltily conscious that happiness has eluded them in a society in which it is the only good, there the children of affluence wail and fret over their broken toys and broken hopes and unresponding flesh. No matter, press on, grasping after new toys, new hopes, and new flesh. In the birth pill, quasi-divine invention, a little death wish in itself, may be seen the crowning glory of the pursuit of happiness through sex. Adapting Voltaire's famous saying, if the pill had not been invented, it would have been necessary for it to exist. What laborious days and nights to bring it into existence. What ingenuity and concentration of purpose on the single objective, the achievement of unprocreative procreation, of coitus non interruptus, that is guaranteed also to be non fecundus. What armies of mice and rats and rabbits and other such small deer to be experimented upon until, oh, glory, hallelujah, their tiny wombs, minutely dissected out, are seen to be blessedly vacant, despite prior coupling, holding out to all mankind the sublime prospect, the converse of what was vouchsafed the Virgin Mary of likewise being able to couple without conceiving. A minificat rather than a magnificat. With the pill, the procreative process has at last been sanctified with sterility. Aphrodite sinking into the sea, unminstrel and forever sterile, unending, infertile orgasm, a death-wish formula if ever there was one. Is it not remarkable 
millions upon millions of women dedicated to the pursuit of happiness, all pummeled and perfumed and pomaded, all coiffured and clothed and contained in accordance with the best television and glossy page recommendations, stuffed full of vitamins, fruit juice, and rare steaks, with svelte, sun-tanned, agile bodies, their hands beseechingly outstressed, insistently demanding a specific against conception. Ready to run any risk, make any sacrifice, suffer any disability, loss of appetite, if not of wits, growing sick and languid, sexless even, and fat, provided only they can be guaranteed full and accident-proof sterility. This neat compact death wish, so easily swallowed, is for export as well as home consumption, under the auspices of the World Health Organization and other enlightened agencies, earnest colporters of contraception carry the good news to darkest Africa. Awesome lady missionaries of family planning take their coils and caps and pills, as traders once did with colored beads, to the teeming population of Asia and Latin America. Only among the Western educated, however, do they find any appreciable number of clients. In the countryside, their product has few takers. The result is that it is the new bourgeoisie, admirers of O. Calcutta, rather than residents of Calcutta proper who take the pill. The others continue to procreate regardless, leaving the apostles of the liberal mind to the self-genocide they have chosen. If sex provides the mysticism of the great liberal death wish, it needs as well its own special mumbo-jumbo and brainwashing device, a moral equivalent of conversion, whereby the old Adam is put aside and the new liberal man is born, enlightened, erudite, cultivated. This is ready in hand in education in all its many branches and affiliations. To the liberal mind, education provides the universal panacea. Whatever the problem Education will solve it. Law and order breaking down? Then yet more statistics chasing yet more education. Venereal disease spreading to the point that girls of ten are found to be infected? Then, for heaven's sake, more sex education, with tiny tots lisping out what happens to mummy's vagina when daddy erects, as they did once the catechism. Drug addiction going up by leaps and bounds, especially in the homes where educational television is looked at, and the whole family marches to protest against the Vietnam War, surely it's obvious that the kids need extra classes under trained psychiatrists to instruct them in the why and the wherefore of narcotics, and so on. On radio and television panels, on which I have spent more time than I care to remember, to questions such as, what does the panel think should be done about the rising rate of juvenile delinquency? The answer invariably offered is, more education. I can hear the voice ringing out now as I write these words, the male ones throaty and earnest, with a tinge of indignation, the female ones particularly resonant, as they insist that not only should there be more education, but more and better education. It gives us all a glow of righteousness and high purpose, more and better education. That's the way to get rid of juvenile delinquency, and adult delinquency for that matter, and all other delinquencies. If we try hard enough and are prepared to pay enough, then surely we can educate ourselves out of all of our miseries and troubles and into the happiness we seek and deserve. If some panel member, as it might be me, ventures to point out that we have been having more in what purports to be better education for years past, and that nonetheless juvenile delinquency is still year by year rising and shows every sign of going on so doing. He gets cold and hostile looks. If he then adds that, in his opinion, education is a stupendous fraud perpetrated by the liberal mind on a bemused public and calculated not just not to reduce juvenile delinquency, but positively to increase it, being itself a source of this very thing. 
that if it goes on following its present course, it will infallibly end by destroying the possibility of anyone having any education at all, the end product of the long, expensive course from kindergarten to postgraduate studies being neo-Stone Age men. Why, then, a perceptible shudder goes through the other panelists, and even the studio audience. It is blasphemy. The bustling campuses multiply and expand, as do their faculties and buildings. More and more professors instruct more and more students in more and more subjects, producing barely articulate graduates, who irresistibly recall to me the Bez Prisorni I remember so vividly from my time in the USSR, those wild children whose parents and guardians had died in the great Russian famines of the early 20s, but who had somehow lived on themselves to race about Moscow and Leningrad and Kiev like wolf packs. Their wild, pinched faces, their bright animal eyes, suddenly glimpsed when they rushed out from under some bridge or embankment. Have I not seen them again among our own pampered children? wearing their proletarian fancy dress on any campus between the Berlin Wall and the California coastline. Here, too, the death-wish cycle completes itself. Pursuing knowledge, we find ignorance and join hands across the civilized centuries with our own primitive, savage origins. A Picasso, after a lifetime's practice, arrives at the style of the cave drawings in the Pyrenees and Beethoven is drowned in the insistent beat of jungle drums and jungle cries. The struggle to extricate meaning and order from confusion and chaos is abandoned, and literature itself reverts to total incoherence, in the process disappearing. Fiat Knox. I see the great liberal death wish driving through the years ahead in triple harness with the gospel of progress in the pursuit of happiness. These are three horsemen of the apocalypse, progress, happiness, death. Under their auspices, the quest for total affluence leads to total deprivation, for total peace to total war, for total education to total illiteracy, for total sex to total sterility, for total freedom to total servitude. Seeking only agreement based on a majority, we find a consensus based on a consensocracy, or oligarchy of the liberal mind, of whose operation an admitted maestro, R.H.S. Crossman, former minister in Harold Wilson's government and new statesman editor, has written in his inimitable way, Better the liberal elitism of the statute book than the reactionary populism of the marketplace. Seeking only truth supported by facts, we find only fantasy supported by celluloid or video dreams seen through a camera eye brightly. The camera, like the pill, a minuscule death wish. All the world compressed into a television screen, seen with, not through, the eye, and so, as Blake tells us, leading us to believe a lie. What lies believed, so many and so varied, from far and near, satellite carried, earnestly spoken, persuasively whispered, in living color, the lie, the whole lie, and nothing but the lie. Demonstrators waiting, bearded men and brawless girls poised to emit their shrill cries, placards grounded, police standing by, their van discreetly parked, one or two journalists looking at their watches and thinking of additions. Everyone waiting. When, oh when, will they come? At last, patience rewarded, the cameras arrive and are set up. Sound recordists ready, cameramen ready. Action! And lo, magically action it is. Beards wag, breasts shake, placards lift, fists clench, 
slogans chant, police charge, van loads, screaming, yelling, pigs, until cut. All is over. Slogans die away. Beards and breasts subside. Cops and vans drive off. All depart, leaving the streets silent. From action to cut. O oh, death wish, where is thy sting? As the astronauts soar into the vast eternities of space, on Earth the garbage piles higher. As the grooves of academe extend their domain, their alumni's arms reach lower. As the great phallic cult spreads, so does impotence. In great wealth, great poverty, in health, sickness, in numbers, deception, gorging, left hungry, sedated, left restless, telling all, hiding all, in flesh united, forever separate. So we press on through the valley of abundance that leads to the wasteland of satiety, passing through the gardens of fantasy, seeking happiness ever more ardently and finding despair ever more surely.